Molly, where's my sandwich? Aiden yelled from the TV room. I'm coming. And don't forget the pickles on mine, yelled Ethan. I grabbed everything quickly, packed it on the tray, and hustled to the TV room. My brothers snatched the tray and began to devour their meals. Not even so much as a thank you, but I guess I was accustomed to it by now. Just then, Aiden's phone rang. Hello, good day, Mr. Peterson. How can I help you? He listened for a bit before responding. Yes, he's here. I'll put it on loudspeaker. Beat it, you brat. Ethan snarled as he grabbed me roughly by the arm, threw me out of the room, and closed the door. I rubbed my arm and opened the door slightly, kneeled, and placed my ear by the opening. Mr. Peterson told my brothers that he wanted 25 passports and ID cards in three days. He was willing to pay them $25,000. And then suddenly the door opened, and what happened next changed my life forever. Hi, I'm Molly. Before I continue my crazy story, tap that thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to smash that notification bell so you'll know when more stories like mine are posted. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of my backstory. Mom married dad who had twin boys. Mom was an only child and dad had an older sister, Stephanie. My brothers and I were never really close as they're nine years older than me. Dad came from a wealthy family and he also had his own medical practice. A few days after my 16th birthday, my parents were headed to the airport to attend a medical conference out of state. Unfortunately, they got into a fatal car accident. My brothers got custody over me. That was about six months ago. Since then, my life has been a series of unfortunate events. You look exhausted. Ember, my best friend, remarked when I met her that morning for a daily walk to school. I stifled a yawn. Aiden and Ethan had a few friends over last night. I was up until 4 a.m. putting the house back together. You're not their maid, you know. You should stand up for yourself. It's two against one. The odds aren't exactly in my favor. Just as we entered the school gates, the bell rang and we hurried for our last class. That afternoon, I walked home from school alone since Ember had swimming practice. Upon entering the house, I heard the phone ringing. Aiden? Ethan? I yelled as I entered. The ringing stopped. Well, that's strange. I muttered when I didn't receive a reply. My brothers were usually at home around this time. The phone rang again. I wasn't allowed to answer the phone, but what if something happened to my brothers? Should I answer it or let it ring? We didn't have an answering machine, so maybe I should. This ping pong match lasted for a few seconds, and I finally put the receiver to my ear. Hello? Hi, Molly. Mr. Holdings, the family lawyer, greeted me. How have you been? I'm okay. Would you like to leave a message for Ethan or Aiden? Actually, I'm glad I got you. I've been wanting to speak with you about your parents' will. A few days after my parents died, Aiden and Ethan spoke to the lawyer. They never gave me any information from the meeting. Okay, what is it? Have you been receiving the stipend your parents left for you monthly? Stipend? I raised an eyebrow. Mr. Holdings went on to explain that my parents left me a monthly stipend of $2,500 per month and a stipend for my brothers, or guardian, which was about $5,000 to ensure I was well taken care of. Since my parents died, I haven't received as much as a new t-shirt from my brothers. I haven't received anything. Then I would assume they didn't tell you that your parents left you a house and two million dollars. No, they didn't. <gasps> I was shocked. How could my brothers keep this type of information from me? Molly, are you sure you're okay? Your Aunt Stephanie would be happy to take you if your brothers aren't taking care of you. I hesitated for a moment. Aiden and Ethan told me stories about how Aunt Stephanie treated them in the past. The nickname they had for her was Cruella. Maybe they were lying about her. If I didn't live with them, then they wouldn't get the stipend. I threw caution to the wind and told Mr. Holdings about everything that had happened over the past six months. Mr. Holdings told me that he would contact me with my new living arrangements but I needed to give him some time. I told him that I wasn't allowed to use the phone. He said he would try and find a way to get a message to me. Before hanging up, I told him to please not tell my brothers about our conversation. He assured me that our conversation was confidential. After chatting with Mr. Holdings, I felt lighter and somewhat relieved. Maybe I can have a brighter future than the one I envisioned. Over the next three weeks, I didn't hear anything from Mr. Holdings. I just can't take this anymore, I muttered to myself one evening while preparing sandwiches for my brothers. 
By hook or by crook, I have to find a way out of here. Molly, where's my sandwich? Aiden yelled from the TV room. I'm coming! And don't forget the pickles on mine! Yelled Ethan. I grabbed everything quickly, packed it on the tray, and hustled to the TV room. My brothers snatched the tray and began to devour their meal. Not even so much as a thank you. But I guess I was accustomed to it by now. Just then, Aiden's phone rang. Hello, good day, Mr. Peterson. How can I help you? He listened for a bit before responding. Yes, he's here. I'll put it on loudspeaker. Beat it, you brat. Ethan snarled as he grabbed me roughly by the arm, threw me out of the room, and closed the door. I rubbed my arm and opened the door slightly, kneeled, and placed my ear by the opening. Mr. Peterson told my brothers that he wanted 25 passports and ID cards in three days. He was willing to pay them $25,000. Suddenly, the door opened, and startled, I fell into the room. What the heck are you doing? Ethan growled. I was looking for my contact lens. After you threw me out of the room, it fell out, you idiot. I snapped. Ethan raised his hand to slap me, but Aiden held his hand back. We don't have time for this. Deal with her when we come back. We have things to take care of. Ethan shoved me against the wall and pointed his finger in my face. Clean the kitchen before we come back. I cleaned the kitchen already. No, you haven't. Ethan looked at me smugly before turning away and heading towards the kitchen. I heard glass shattering and things being thrown against the wall. Aiden and I walked to the kitchen. By the time we got there, it was totally trashed. Now. Ethan adjusted his clothes. Clean it up. He turned to Aiden. Let's go. As soon as my brothers left, I sprinted to the basement. I had a hunch. Dad always had spare keys lying around just in case. I needed to get the office open. I figured that's where they were doing their illegal business since it was the only locked door in a house and I never cleaned that room. I found the small box with the keys and headed to the office. If I was able to get the door open, I would be able to get a passport and an ID card. I was always told that I looked over 18 anyway, so I didn't doubt that my charade would work. The box held about 20 keys, and I swore under my breath as I tried key after key, but none opened the door. I was about to give up when I pushed the key in and I heard the lock open. I sighed in relief. I stepped into the office and closed the door behind me. Everything in the office was set up, and it looked easy enough to create the items that I needed. I got to work quickly. As soon as I finished creating my passport and ID card, I called the police and told them about my brother's illegal business. I also told them that my brothers had locked me in a room and I needed help to escape. The officer on the other end said that a car was on their way to me. I smiled slyly as I hung up the phone. I ran to my room and I packed a bag quickly and returned to the office and headed for Dad's safe. I needed to get enough money to survive until I could find a way to get to Mr. Holding's office. Luckily for me, my brothers did not change the code for the safe. As soon as it was open, I began to pile money into my bag. While doing this, I heard a frosty voice behind me, and my eyes widened. Are you stealing from us, little sister? I spun around, and there stood Ethan by the door. I quickly zipped up my bag and placed it on my back before standing to face him. If I were you, I would put it back. Ethan stepped into the room and walked menacingly towards me. Or would you prefer we speak with the police? I'm not stealing from anyone. Mr. Holdings told me about the money mom and dad left me and the stipend they're giving you to take care of me. So please, Ethan, call the police. I bet they would just love to know how you've been treating me over the past six months and not giving me my stipend that my parents left for me. Now if you'll excuse me, I'll be leaving now. Molly? Aiden's voice came from behind Ethan. I pushed past Ethan and tried to exit the office, but Aiden wouldn't let me pass. Look, we're sorry about the way we treated you. We all suffered tremendous loss and we didn't handle the situation as we should have. I know it would take some time for us to make it up to you, but please forgive us and allow us to. Family should stick together. Isn't that what your mom always used to say? The sincerity in Aiden's voice made me reconsider if I was doing the right thing. He was right. They'd also lost their dad and the past six months have been hard. I sighed heavily. So, what do you say? Truce? Aiden extended his hand. A small smile curved my lips. I took up his hand and shook it. And then suddenly Aiden jerked my hand, twisted it behind my back and pinned me to the wall. You trust way too easily, Molly. That's no way to live your life. Whether you like it or not, you're stuck with us for the next two years. 
The doorbell rang and everyone froze. When no one responded, the person on the other side identified himself as a police officer. Take her to the basement and make sure she stays there. Eden instructed Ethan. Ethan placed his hand over my mouth as he dragged me, kicking and screaming to the basement, while Eden answered the front door. Ethan threw open the basement door and threw me inside and closed the door behind us. I searched for anything that would help me get the upper hand on Ethan, who was taller and stronger than I was. My eyes came across a hockey stick in the corner. I glanced at Ethan, who may have guessed what I was planning to do. He lunged at me, but I quickly sidestepped him and went for the hockey stick. My fingers grazed the hockey stick, but I wasn't able to hold on as Ethan grabbed hold of my hair and pulled me back. I struggled to get free, my hands groping aimlessly around the basement for anything I could use. My hands held onto something cold and hard. It was a wrench. I swung it at Ethan, but he dodged it and threw me to the ground. His knees on either side of my chest, he snatched the wrench from my grasp. Hunched over me, his face contorted in anger. He pressed it against my neck. I used my hands to try and push him off, but he was too strong. My air supply was being cut off. I was on the verge of passing out when the basement door flew open. Hands in the air or I'll shoot. Ethan dropped the wrench and stood up. I rubbed my neck weakly. Oh, Molly. I heard Aunt Stephanie's voice. The officer handcuffed Ethan and Aunt Stephanie helped me to get to my feet and hugged me. Are you okay? I nodded with tears in my eyes. Let's get you out of here. We walked to the living room where another officer, Mr. Holdings, and Aiden were standing. Molly, all the arrangements have been made and you'll be staying with your aunt from now on. Ethan laughed devilishly. <laughs> you think your aunt Stephanie is better than we are? Come on, let's get you to the station. The officer pulled Ethan towards the door. Ethan looked over his shoulder. You're making a big mistake. Are you ready to go, sweetie? Auntie Stephanie looked at me. I nodded and we left. The next few months with Auntie Stephanie was a breath of fresh air. We went shopping, stayed up late watching movies, and I even got a cell phone and a laptop. Life was great. The only thing was that I had to switch schools so I couldn't see Ember as much as I wanted to, but we chatted every night before going to bed. One night, while I was about to step into the kitchen, I heard Aunt Stephanie chatting with someone on the phone. I assumed it was Mr. Holdings since she asked if she could get a larger stipend since taking care of a teenage girl was costly. Hurt by what I just heard, I went into my room and packed a bag. I can't believe I fell for it. All she's interested in is the money. It was never about me. I still had the money, the passport, and the fake ID from all of those months ago. I waited until my aunt was sleeping that night before I ran away. I was able to get a decent apartment and a part-time job after school, which kept me afloat until my 18th birthday. When my birthday finally came around, I contacted Mr. Holdings and I was given access to my inheritance. I refused to let anyone get close to me because I don't know if they like me or the money that I have. Maybe this will change in the future, but until then, it's important for me to keep my peace. I was trying not to let my history teacher, Mr. Wilson, see how bored I was as he droned on and on about World War I. As soon as the bell went, I pushed back my chair and I was out of that classroom in a flash. I couldn't wait to get home. The minute I walked through my front door, I shouted to my mom, Mom, I'm home. Come and help me get out of this thing. My mom came through the kitchen where she'd been preparing dinner. Okay, okay, hold on. I turned around and my mom unzipped the back of my suit. I stepped out of it, revealing my true height. I'm actually only four feet tall. But before I tell you the rest of this crazy story, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell too, because you definitely don't want to miss out on any more stories like mine. I had a difficult childhood. It wasn't too bad when I was really young because all of my friends were small too. But as the years went by, my friends all started getting taller and taller. But I didn't grow. Of course, my parents took me to see lots of doctors and specialists, but no one could tell them why I wasn't growing. I definitely didn't have any medical condition that was causing it, so basically there wasn't anything they could give me to help. In the end, my parents told me that it was just something I was gonna have to accept. But it was easy for them to say that. They weren't the ones who had to put up with the constant teasing. Everywhere I went, it was the same old story. Hey, Shorty! Need some help getting onto that chair? 
Why are you so small? Don't your parents feed you? Whenever I went into town, people just stopped and stared. It was so embarrassing. But the worst thing of all was having to buy all of my clothes in the little kids section. Nearly every outfit I owned had some kind of Disney character on it. When I saw the clothes the other girls were wearing, I was so jealous. It's not fair. Why do I have to be so small? When I was at my old school, I didn't use a suit. There really wasn't any point because everyone there already knew that I was short. We'd all grown up together, so I couldn't pretend to be a normal height like them. Even though my life was pretty miserable, there was one thing, or, well, should I say one person, that made me happy to be alive. His name was Robbie. We'd been friends for a long time, but what he didn't know was that I had a secret crush on him. From the moment I set my eyes on him, I was smitten. We would hang out at the park together on weekends, playing ball and eating picnics. He was so much fun, but he never showed any feelings towards me. The more and more time I spent with him, the more I fell in love with him. Until eventually, I couldn't keep it inside any longer. I decided that I was going to have to confess how I really felt. I waited until we were all alone and I took a deep breath. Robbie, I have something to tell you. What? Well, um, you know how we're really good friends? Yes. And, uh, you know how we always hang out together? Yes. Well, it's just that... Come on, Sarah, spit it out. I kind of got a crush on you. I waited to see his reaction. In my dreams, I'd imagined him sweeping me up into his arms and declaring undying love for me. But sadly... That wasn't what happened. Oh, Sarah, I'm sorry. You're just too young for me. I looked at him in shock. What are you talking about? We're the same age. Now it was his turn to look shocked. What? No way! I thought you were a toddler. I couldn't believe it when he said that. I felt like my heart was broken into two. I was mortified. I, I didn't want to wait around to hear any more from him. Um, I've got to go. See you. I ran off in the opposite direction as fast as I could. When I got home, I went straight to my room and lay on my bed sobbing. Tears streamed down my face. That's it. I'm never going back to that school again. I managed to persuade my parents to let me change schools. I just need a new start. I want to go somewhere where no one knows me. Somewhere I can just make a new life for myself. But even if you change schools, Sarah... You will still be the same height. No, I have an idea. What idea? So I've been doing some research on the internet and... Okay, look what I found. I showed my mom the website that I'd found. It shows you here how you can make a special kind of suit, kind of like a robot thing. I can wear it every day when I go to school and people will think that I'm normal height, just like them. I don't know, Sarah. Are you sure this is what you want to do? Definitely. Please say you'll help me. Okay then, if you're absolutely sure. Thank you, Mom. My parents both helped me to make the suit. I was really nervous when it came to the time to try it on, but as soon as I stepped inside, I instantly felt happy. I looked in the mirror. It's amazing! No one would ever guess that I'm only four feet tall. Now, everyone will treat me normally instead of focusing on my height. My first day at my new school was fantastic. It might sound strange to you, but the best thing was I could walk down a corridor without anyone noticing me. It was as if I didn't even exist. I had never felt that feeling before. Usually everywhere I went, people pointed and whispered about me, but now there was nothing about me for them to talk about. I settled in really quickly and soon made some new friends. Everything was so much easier now that I looked exactly the same as everyone else. But then it all went wrong. The first time I saw Martin was at the school canteen. He was sitting with his friends and they were laughing and joking around. He looked up and caught my eye, and then he gave me a beaming smile and winked at me. I looked away shyly, but then I glanced back and he was still staring at me, so I smiled back. Hey, come and join us! I looked behind me to make sure he wasn't talking to someone else, but I realized it was me he was asking. Oh, uh, thanks, yeah. I went over to their table and they made room for me to sit down next to Martin. You're new here, aren't you? Yeah, I've been here for a couple of weeks. What's your name? Sarah. I'm Martin. So, Sarah, do you have a boyfriend? 
No, I, I don't. Perfect! I could feel my cheeks turning bright red. Is he flirting with me? So, what do you say we go out on a date? Oh my god, he was flirting with me. Oh, yeah, that would be great. Martin and I soon became an item. I loved walking down the street with him, my hand in his hand. It was so nice to not look like an odd couple. But the more time that I spent with Martin, the harder it was to keep my secret. One time he suggested that we go swimming, but there was no way I could swim in my suit. It wasn't waterproof, and the last thing I needed was it to start filling up with water, so I made up some excuse and thankfully Martin accepted it. But another time, he almost caught me. It was Saturday morning and Martin had told me that he was going to play soccer with his friends. I was sitting in the lounge watching TV when I heard a tap on the window. I turned around and I saw Martin standing there. Surprise! My heart started beating madly. Luckily, I was sitting on the couch so he couldn't see how tall I was, but I knew that if I stood up, he would see straight away that I was so small. I could feel the panic starting to build up inside of me. Come on then, aren't you gonna let me in? Yeah, of course. Um, just go around the back door though, because I don't have the key for the front door. As soon as Martin was out of sight, I jumped up and ran to the kitchen. Mom, quick, you have to help me! Martin's here! I grabbed the suit and I jumped into it. My mom had just got the zip down when Martin knocked on the door. I went and I opened it. Hi! Hi! I thought you were playing soccer with your friends. No, it got cancelled, so I thought I'd come and surprise you. Aren't you glad to see me? Oh yeah, what a lovely surprise! I could see my mom rolling her eyes and shaking her head. She had warned me that I should be honest with Martin about my height. If he loves you, he will love you no matter how tall you are. I just can't risk it, Mom. He doesn't need to know. But I knew that later on, I would be getting a lecture from my mom. I could just hear her now. See, I told you. You should have been honest. One day, he will catch you out. But for now, I was just happy that I'd managed to get into the suit and not let Martin see my real height. Maybe I'll have to tell him one day, but I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. After that, months went by without any other mishaps. I began to forget all about that day and I just enjoyed my relationship with Martin. So anyway, what do you want to do for your birthday? I'm going to have a party. Oh wow, that sounds great. Yeah, my mom said I can invite all my friends over on Saturday night. Does that include me? Of course it does, you're number one on the list. I smiled at Martin, I was so lucky to have him as my boyfriend. He always put me first. Saturday night arrived and I put my best dress on over my suit. When I got to Martin's house, there were already quite a few people there. I knocked on the door and a few seconds later, Martin opened it. Wow, Sarah, you look absolutely stunning. Thank you. Happy birthday. I went into the room. The party was already in full swing. The music was loud and everyone looked like they were having lots of fun. Wait here, I'll go get you a drink. Okay. Sarah, come and dance! My friends were all dancing on the other side of the room, so I went and joined them. I love this song! Yeah, me too. We were having so much fun dancing and singing that I didn't notice one of Martin's friends was sitting on a chair with his long legs sticking out. As I spun around, I suddenly tripped right over and went sprawling across the floor. As I fell, my suit got caught on the edge of the chair and ripped straight off my body, revealing my true height. I looked up and I saw Martin coming back into the room. When he saw that I was on the floor, he came running over. But then, suddenly he stopped dead in his tracks and just stared at me. Everyone else just stopped what they were doing. It was as if the world had stopped for a few seconds. But then the whole place erupted and people were screaming and pointing. Some people looked petrified as they scrambled to get out of the house. In a matter of minutes, the place had emptied. The only people left were Martin and me. Why, Sarah? Why the pretense? I didn't think that you would like me if you knew I was this short. Martin looked so sad. You lied to me. How can I ever trust you again? I'm sorry. I think you'd better go. I picked up my suit and left the house. And you probably think that I should have been prepared for Martin's reaction. But I wasn't. I'd been living such a fantastic life that I'd almost forgotten that I was living a lie. The next day, when I went to school, I wore my suit as usual, but no one spoke to me. 
every one of my friends gave me the cold shoulder. When I saw Martin, I went straight up to him. I know you don't like me anymore because I'm short. It's not that. It's because you lied to me. I couldn't care less if you're short. I don't believe you. It's true. The next day, I decided to see if Martin was really telling the truth. I went to school without my suit on. Of course, everyone stared at me, but I held my head high and walked down the corridor. When I got to the lockers, I could see Martin standing there. As soon as he saw me, he gave me a big smile and held my hand. I am so sorry I lied to you. I just didn't want to lose you. It's okay, I understand. You're not going to lose me. Really? Do you really mean that? I love you, Sarah. Tall or short. At first, it wasn't easy coping with the stairs again, but eventually, with Martin's help, I became more and more confident. And then something amazing happened. I got picked up for a documentary series about my unique life. Now I work as an influencer. I help people to feel good about themselves. This is your body for the rest of your life. You have a choice to either love it or hate it. If you're going to be stuck in it forever, you might as well love it, right? What do you mean you have her in custody? I listened to the person on the other end of the line. But there must be an explanation. I'll be right there. I hung up the phone, grabbed the jacket for my suit and my briefcase, and walked out of my office. Yvonne, please hold my calls for the rest of the afternoon and shift my appointments, I told my secretary as I passed her desk. I jogged out of the building and jumped into my car. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that a mistake had been made and I needed to get to the bottom of it. Hi, my name is Mason. Have you liked this video and channel yet? If not, you are missing some amazing stories. After you've liked this video and subscribed, tap that notification bell so you'll never miss another story. I remember it like it was yesterday. I decided to leave work early and head to the park. I thought a bit of sunshine and fresh breeze would help with the migraine that rumbled in my head. With my legs stretched out, I placed my hand behind my head and leaned back. The weather was overcast and the breeze was cool. Suddenly, I felt someone trip over my legs and a small ouch made my eyes fly open. My eyes fell upon the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. I never believed in love at first sight, but then and there, I knew she was the one for me. I extended my hand. I'm so sorry, are you okay? She took it and I helped her onto the bench. I noticed that her knees were bruised. She stared at me. I'll be okay, it's just a little bruise. I wasn't looking where I was going. Your knees, do you need me to take you home or to the doctor to get that cleaned up? I live just a block away, I'll be okay. Nothing a band-aid can't fix. She smiled and walked away. Over the next few days, my mind ran back to the beauty I met in the park. Her ocean blue eyes and smile that could light up any dark place etched in my mind. I should have insisted on dropping her home or at least getting her phone number or even her name. Do you think that would have been too much? One afternoon at the supermarket, guess who was walking towards me pushing a cart? It was her. I wasn't about to let this chance pass me up, so I approached her. Hi, I don't know if you remember me. I rubbed my hand on the back of my neck nervously, hoping I wasn't making a fool of myself. At the park, right? I still have bruises from the first time I met you. Not easy for a girl to forget. She winked. I laughed. <laughs> Making last impressions is what I do. My name is Mason. I'm Eden. We continued to shop together, and by the time we left the supermarket, we made a coffee date. We decided to meet at the coffee shop for our first date. I showed up with flowers and chocolates in hand. I looked around the shop, and Eden waved at me from a corner booth at the back. Hi, these are for you. I handed over the gifts. Mason, thank you, you didn't have to. I know, but I wanted to. I smiled. Have you ordered yet? No, I was waiting for you. That was the beginning of a beautiful relationship. Eden and I went on a few more dates before we decided to become a couple. Eden was loving, considerate, and it seemed as though she didn't get angry ever. She always looked for ways to bring a smile to everyone's face. She volunteered at the orphanage as well as the Salvation Army. She definitely was a gem to be treasured. I'd like to meet your parents, I mentioned one day while we were having lunch at a restaurant. Eden looked at me worriedly. My parents aren't the easiest people to get along with. I've been dealing with challenging people since I took over my father's company. I'll be okay. This explained why Eden never allowed me to meet her at home. Eden sighed heavily. I'll see what I can do. I didn't press the matter as I realized that the conversation made Eden uncomfortable. You see, Eden still lived with her parents. She wasn't allowed to move until she was married or at least engaged. About two weeks later, I pulled up to Eden's and she exited the house. 
I removed two bouquets and a bottle of whiskey from the passenger seat before landing a kiss on Eden. This one's for you. I handed her a bouquet, which she accepted graciously. Eden looked nervous. I squeezed her hand. It'll be okay. She nodded solemnly, and we walked towards the house. As soon as we entered, she called out, Mom? Dad? Mason's here. A tall, slender woman with her hair pulled back in a tight bun emerged from a room and addressed Eden. It's very unladylike to shout like that. Where are your manners, Eden? Eden's face turned as red as a cherry. I stepped forward and extended my hand. Good evening, ma'am. My name is Mason Pierre. Eden's mother ignored me and addressed Eden once more. Go and get the table ready. Eden shot me an apologetic look and ran off towards the kitchen, followed by her mother. The rest of the night didn't get any better. Mr. Jones, Eden's father, came out when the table was set and dinner was being served. He was a chubby, balding man with a mean expression plastered on his face. So you brought home another one, huh? Mr. Jones said as he cut into his steak. Is he going to use you like that last one and then dump you to marry a model? Well, you know Eden has always been mediocre. A mediocre job with mediocre pay. She needs to take up her role in the company as vice president. I didn't do all of this work for my only daughter not to be a part of it. But mom, I don't- Mrs. Jones waved her off. I know, I know, you want to do something meaningful with your life. Blah, blah, blah. That entire evening, it was Eden against her parents. By the time she walked me to the front door, her eyes were red, and I knew she was on the verge of breaking down in tears. Would you like to go for a drive to clear your head? Eden shook her head and forced a smile. I'll be okay. I'll call you tomorrow, okay? Before I could reply, she closed the door. I walked away from the house thinking about Eden and how to get her away from her parents. I knew exactly what I needed to do. The next weekend, I invited Eden to spend the weekend with my family and I. My younger sister, Judy, was coming home from college for the weekend. As we pulled up, Eden turned to me. I hope they like the gifts I made. I leaned over and kissed her. They will love it, and they'll also love you. Come on. Eden and I were barely out of the car when my parents and my sister bombarded us with welcoming hugs. Welcome, Eden. We've heard so much about you. Mom said as she steered Eden to the house. She's really pretty. Judy nudged me in the ribs and smiled. I wonder why she's with you. Ha ha ha. I said sarcastically before I shot Judy a smile. Once inside, Eden handed my family the quilts she'd made them. Everyone loved them. That afternoon, we played board games, ordered pizza, and Eden even made her famous banana bread. Everyone fell asleep, and I stole Eden away to the back porch swing. I kissed her. Are you enjoying yourself? Yeah, I am. Your family is amazing. She lowered her eyes. You're so lucky. I wish I had a family like this. You can. I pulled out a small black velvet box from my pocket and knelt in front of Eden. Eden Jones, will you make me the happiest man alive? I know we haven't known each other for long, but will you marry me? She threw her arms around me with tears in her eyes. Yes, I'll marry you. My family tumbled out the back door. She said yes, I'm so happy for you, Mason. Mom hugged me, then Eden. Finally, I'll have a big sister to confide in. You did good, son. Eden, welcome to the family. The next few weeks, Eden and I prepared for our wedding. I also gave her access to my credit and banking cards so she could get whatever she needed for the wedding. She also started a new company that focused on the education of orphan children. Of course, being a great fiancé, I invested to show my support. How much, you ask? I invested a sum of $50,000. I mean, why shouldn't I? Her business was going to help orphans get a better education. Everything was going great in our relationship. I even asked Eden to move in with me and she agreed. I was just happy to get her away from her awful parents. As I said, everything was going great until I got that phone call. You know, the phone call I got at the beginning of the story? When I got to the mall, I headed straight to the detention area. What's the meaning of this? My eyes glared at the security guard outside the door. Sir, you need to calm down. Your girlfriend? My fiance. Your girlfriend was caught trying to steal a $10,000 bracelet. There has to be a mistake. I'd like to see her, now. The security opened the door and we entered. Oh, Mason. Eden hugged me and she burst into tears. <laughs> Babe, what happened? Through her tears, Eden explained that a fire alarm went off in the store while she was trying on the bracelet. When she heard the alarm go off just like the other people in the store, she ran to safety. I looked at the security guard who confirmed that the alarm did go off. You have the bracelet, why not just let her go? Sir, it's out of my hands. The police are on their way. If I paid for the bracelet, will this mess go away? The security guard got in contact with the store owner. He agreed that once I paid for the bracelet, that Eden is free to go. So that's what I did. 
About two weeks later, I told Eden that I was working late. Upon arrival, I noticed that all the lights were off. All the lights in my home were never off. I rushed towards the front door. It was unlocked. Eden? Eden! I called her name and flicked every light as I entered the rooms. When I flicked the light of the bedroom, there she was tied to a chair. I rushed over to her. Eden, baby, are you okay? My hands trembled as I loosened the knots. She looked dazed and started to mumble something, but I couldn't understand what it was. I called an ambulance and the police, and they arrived about 15 minutes later. The ambulance took Eden to the hospital, and I followed as soon as I was dismissed by the police. On the way to the hospital, I called my parents as well as Eden's parents to let them know what happened. The doctor told us that she was unconscious, and they would let us know when she was awake. My parents and I sat on one end of the waiting room, and Eden's sat on the other. After a few minutes of glaring at me from across the room, Mrs. Jones got up and approached me. You need to send Eden home at once. Never has she been attacked at home. I want her home at once. Mom stood up and stepped between Mrs. Jones and I. You don't think Mason is responsible for this, do you? This time, Mr. Jones answered. Of course he is. A man is supposed to secure his home. Your son wasn't able to do that. He is not to be trusted with Eden. Dad chimed in and stood next to Mom. Maybe if you were a better father, she wouldn't have wanted to run away from you. Eden is grown up and allowed to make her own choices. You people are delusional. The next few minutes resulted in a fierce back and forth argument between my parents and Eden's. It probably would have gone on forever if a nurse hadn't threatened to kick us out if they didn't stop. By the time we actually got to see Eden, it was five hours later. I wasn't surprised when she agreed with her parents that she should move back home, at least until we got married. It would take years before Eden broke free from her parents' manipulative ways. I promised to add more security cameras and change all the bolts on the doors. At least the wedding was still on. The day before the wedding, Eden and I decided to meet at the park, the place where it all began. I prepared a picnic lunch for the both of us and we planned to meet at the park for 12.30. At 1 p.m., Eden still had not arrived and I was worried. I called her phone and it went straight to voicemail. At 1.30 p.m., I drove to her parents' home to see if they knew where she was. I knocked on the door and waited. I was surprised when a stranger opened the door. Hi, good afternoon. Is Eden in? The man looked at me strangely. There isn't anyone here by that name. Is Mr. or Mrs. Jones here? May I speak with them? Sorry, no one lives here by that name. The man closed the door in my face. Just then, my phone rang. It was Judy. She told me that her check for school was declined and asked if I could look into it. I hung up and wondered about Eden. At the bank, I was told that everything from my credit and debit cards were withdrawn. I asked them how that could be when I didn't authorize anything. They told me that it was taken out by a Miss Eden Jones. My heart stopped. Eden had been toying with me all this time. But that wasn't the least of it. When I got home, everything was gone. The neighbors knew we were getting married, so they assumed we were moving to another house. Eden stole everything. You'd think I'd be upset. The truth is, I'm still in love with Eden. She was actually the best girlfriend I've ever had. Eden, if you're watching, I just want you to know that I love you. I'm sure we can work things out. Please, babe, give me a call.